morning. How's everybody doing? Good? Cool. Hey, my name is Ty. I'm one of the pastors here. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. We are continuing our series, Tis the Season. It's kind of the idea that, uh, you know, uh, kind of much like the wrapping paper here, the season, the holidays can kind of leave us feeling ragged and kind of crumpled a little bit. And so what do we want to do over the November, December is kind of walk through what the Bible says about things that we'll deal with during the holiday season, like contentment and stress and you know, things of that nature. And today we're going to talk about family. Because we're going to deal with family during the holidays, right? Most of us here will deal with some sort of family. We'll have uh, either going to our family or coming back to our family or the family will be coming here or whatever that looks like. Somehow, some way, we'll probably be engaging our family. So how do we handle that? Well, here's what I know. I love my family. I love my family. I love everything about my family. I've got an awesome family. I just think they're great. And of course, we've got dysfunction in our family, just like everyone else has dysfunction in family. But family is very important to me. I remember growing up as a kid, I liked watching families on TV. I don't know if you guys did or not, but I would watch those families no matter how good your family is. You would see those families sometimes and think, huh, I wish I could fit into that family. Do you ever have those type type of families you watch? So I like pop culture and just trivia and things of that nature. So here's what I want to do. I want to give you a few clues And I want you, when you have it, to yell out what family or what TV show I'm talking about, okay? So I'll give you some clues, maybe the family's name or something that happens on the show, and then you'll yell out it's whatever show it is. You ready? All right. Hey, Jack. Happy, happy, happy. (laughs) Duck Dynasty. Okay. I love that show. That show's funny. Or here's a story of a lovely lady. Brady Bunch. Okay. Uh, The Pritchards. Modern Family. Okay, okay. Uh, what about Cliff and Claire Huxtable? The Cosby's, one of my favorite shows, Rudy and Theo and all that. I loved that show as a kid. Uh, what about this noise? Maybe you'll know the show. Dope! Simpson, that was a terrible Homer Simpson impersonation. Okay. What about, this one might be a little stretched. This is in the 90s. What about the Connors? Boom, nailed it. That's great. Nailed it. All right. Uh, who shot JR? Dallas, never got into that one. Um, Here's the one I caught my girls watching the other day. I thought it was funny back from my era. Uh, Danny Tanner. Cut it out. Oh, you remember that? Okay, cool. All right, cool. Uh, and then here's one uh, of recent years that was one of my favorites. Uh, this might be a little bit stretched for you. You might not get this, and it's okay. It's a little bit of uh, kind of buried under there. Michael, George Michael, Tobias Funke. Arrested Development, awesome. It's great. Yeah, it's one of my favorite shows. Now, you ever thought, wouldn't it be nice if we could be like a sitcom family? And some of you are like, man, man, my family's just like a sitcom family. It's kind of crazy like in some of those other shows. But what if our family was like a sitcom family? You know, like within 30 minutes, you can have the worst thing in the world happen within your family. Like it's imploding, but in 30 minutes, it's all taken care of. Like at the end of every episode, everyone's hugging and loving. They're sitting down to a meal or whatever that looks like. And it's all great. What if we had that type of family? Well, we realize that uh, that family does not exist. It's on TV. It is, a, it is not a reality. But here's what I know, that God has a lot to say about family. He has a ton to say about family. And I mean, here's what happens. During the holiday season, typically a lot of baggage and a lot of pain can resurface from our families. Some of that may come from childhood. There might be some pain, some complications, some difficulties in our childhood that, um, that has left us maybe a little bit resentful of our parents, maybe a little bit bitter. For others, maybe someone did something to you or they are continually doing something to you in your family. Like you go back to your parents or you go back to your family because most of us that live here are not from here, so we have to go back to our families. And so when we get there, it's interesting enough, we lay our baggage down, but then they have other baggage for us. They're packing a trip for us. You know what that's called, right? A guilt trip. And so that makes some complications within a family. Or maybe someone did something to you, lied to you, lied about you, whatever that looks like. But I know the the holiday season can really bring a lot of difficulties out. Maybe you had that uh, overpowering dictator dad or that smothering mother because you can't have the word smother without a mother. Right? What is it like? Maybe so. It can bring out a lot of difficulty. See, I, I believe in, our, in family context, there's something that we, we have this deep desire for, something, a longing in us, something we want uh, exceptionally uh, and needy for. It's for acceptance. I mean, isn't that kind of the idea of family, that family will be loyal to one another no matter what, that family will love and, and family will accept, and you will never feel that sense of rejection or, or repulsion from them, that they will always love you? We want acceptance within the family context, but it's not always there. Is it even possible to be fully accepted in a family? I don't know. 
But I know the Bible talks a lot about family. The Bible is all about Jesus. And when you see when Jesus comes, he loves us and he places us into a family. So the Bible has a lot to talk about family. If you've got a Bible, go to Psalm 100. We're going to start there today. We'll be all over the place. This message is going to look a little different than normal. Um, it's just going to be different, okay? Psalm 100. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. We put the scripture up on the screen for you, for you so you can follow along. We also have free Bibles out back. And then uh, if you go on version right now, it's like a Bible app. Uh, you can hit live and uh, type in Grace Point Vegas or something. It's all on there, the notes and the scripture. It's kind of cool. Psalm 100. Now, this psalm is a hymn. It's a song. And so this, is, this song is about the God, is the, the king of the universe. And the cool thing about this is that God is king of the universe, and he invites us to come and to worship him, to come and to sing to him. And then also I want you to key in. There's a lot of family language right here within the context of this psalm. Let's start it out. Psalm 100. We're going to read the whole thing. Verse 1, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Now, for those of us, me included, that cannot sing, this is our verse. Because like what comes out of our mouth is probably not pleasing to everyone's ear around here, but it's pleasing to God's ear because he says, make a joyful noise right here. This is beautiful. There's a lot of singing. Look at verse 2. Serve the Lord with gladness. That when we serve the Lord, it's not out of compulsion, it's not out of begrudgingly, but it's out of, it's out of gladness to him. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. Now watch this. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter the gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. Verse 5. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Now, some people ask sometimes, Ty, why at Grace Point Church do you sing so many songs? Why do you sing so much? Well, you look at songs of the Bible, these hymns of the Bible, the Psalms, you see that we're called to come and to sing to God, to enter his house in praising. So this is one, one of many reasons. But I, I want to ask you, did you notice the family language there? Look, look in verse 3. There's this phrase there that says, he who made us. Now, when we first look at that, we're like, okay, it, maybe all of us here, maybe some of us here believe that God created us. And so that's some language there. But I believe it's even more than that. We've got to take it one step further. Look at the next line. It says, made us to be his people. Now the us there in this context is Israel. It's the Old Testament people, Israel. He made Israel to be his people. But in the, in, in the implications from that, what it means from that for us, that if we are in Christ, we are Christians that he made us to be his people. This is what God is saying. I'm your daddy. You'll be my children. And I am the king of the universe, and I want family. That's exactly, and he, he made us. Just like children don't make their parents their parents. The parents make the children their parents. You know, does that make sense? And so God makes us his children. He, he desires to have family that we would be his children. That's what he's talking about right here. He made us that way. Look down at verse 5. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Now, steadfast love is one of, the, uh, one of the themes here of the Old Testament over and over and over about the quality of God, that his steadfast love, his faithfulness, that he will not leave us nor forsake us, that he'll always be there with us through thick and thin, that he will accept us. And we see that that's because of Jesus here in a little bit. He accepts us, not a rejection, his faithfulness is right there. To all generations. It means he wants us to pass on from generation to generation to generation. See, God loves us and makes us family. Huge. Just huge. It's the idea of acceptance and loyalty to be passed on to generation to generation to generation. And see, when I talk about sitcom families and you talk about this idea that God loves us and God wants us to be in a family, see, our, our natural tendency is to turn inward a little bit and say, well, Ty, you don't understand. My family is highly dysfunctional. We put the fun in dysfunctional. I mean, like, we're kind of a mess. We've got oddballs, and we've got people that are a total mess, and we've got people that have wrecked their lives, and we've got conflict, and we have all these things going on in my family. So this apparently doesn't apply to my family because my family's not like that. Okay. Well, you've got to look at Jesus' family. We don't have to go there. I'm going to talk about this during Christmas Sunday. But in Matthew chapter 1, it gives the genealogy of Jesus. It just kind of shows some, uh, some of the family tree of Jesus. And within that list, there's murderer, there's liars, there's prostitutes. So Jesus had a dysfunctional family as well. But God loves family. See, this is family. Family is imperfect this side of heaven. All family has dysfunction. All family has a problem. All family have, have these points of maybe rejection of one another, these, these points of problems all throughout our family. 
But the interesting thing is this, that God wants us to be in family. God loves family. God cares about family. I made mention of this a few weeks ago. I'll make it again. That God lives within a family somewhat. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's called the Trinity. It's, it's kind of like family together, the three that, become, that are one. But so when God creates, he creates Adam. He creates Adam alone. He said, Adam alone is not good. Adam needs a family. So he creates Eve, and he tells them to be fruitful and multiply, and they have children. Then there's this guy later on in the Old Testament. His name is Abraham. And he promised Abraham a huge family. He said, your family is going to be so big that, like, the, the stars in the sky, you can't even number them. That's how big your family is going to be. And it kind of bursts from that Israel. And then we get to the New Testament where Jesus is coming. We see that God came down. And where did he come into? Like, what, what, what did he reside in? A family. Joseph and Mary, and you have brothers, and you get within a family. And then we see as Jesus saves, that he saves us not just as individuals, but saves us to a greater family called the church. This is family language, that we are family, family. And as Psalm 100 describes, this family is to be a family that passes it on over and worship God and pass it on. Worship God and pass it on. Be family. This is what he's talking about. So what makes a family? Like, does, is there a certain criteria? You have to do this. You have to be this to be a part of a family. Well, uh, I don't know about you. I like movies. I think movies are cool. I, there's, I like the gangster mob a genre of movies. I think they're kind of neat. There's just something about them. And, and most mob gangster movies, in order to become a made man, which is like to, to kind of follow in the steps of the godfather or whatever that language is there, uh, you had to have a certain bloodline. And so one, one way to be a family is through certain bloodline. Like Angie and I, we have children. Those children are part of our bloodline. So they're part of our family. But there's another way as well. You can make family out of people who are not of the bloodline. It's through adoption and through inclusion, things like you can make those things happen. I mean, think about one of the greatest adoptions ever. We usually don't see it this way, but think about Jesus was adopted. I mean, we, we understand from uh, the Christmas story, which we'll talk about in a couple of weeks, that Jesus was born of a virgin. So guess who's not his daddy? Oh, shocker. <laughs> it's like, it's, Joseph is not his dad. And so, but Joseph accepts him and Joseph loves him as a father should and, and was instructed to. And so we see adoption and blood can both make family. And it both is to cause a sense of you're accepted, you're one of us, you're loved and all that. And yet, that's the area where it gets very tricky within family. is that feeling of acceptance, that feeling of being wanted. And those, those are the times where it's really, truly difficult to live in family sometimes. Why? We struggle with family because we feel those points of rejection, and so it's hard for us to forgive others. We, we feel like our family maybe have done us wrong in the past or something's going on, so it's hard to extend grace to them. It's hard to forgive them. It's hard to you know, it's, it's shed some mercy on them. It's hard to have those conversations. Sometimes it's just hard to be around them because there's these points of rejection we felt because we feel like, Family should always accept us, and family should always be loyal, but however, something happened, and it makes us very different, dif- difficult for us to love them well. So here's what I want to do today. I mean, here's the big idea for today. Acceptance in Christ allows me to blank others. Now, what well, don't put in the blank, ignore others, like, or forget others, or whatever that looks like, but it allows me, it allows me to forgive others. When I truly begin to accept my acceptance in Jesus, that he fully accepts me if I'm in Christ, not because of what I've done, but because of what he has done, it changes everything. Now I can love others, and now I can forgive others, and now I can extend grace to others, and now I can be merciful and compassionate to others. It changes everything. Now I can tolerate others that are different than me. Now I can be around others. Now we can start opening up conversations with others. Do you see that blank right there? What is that blank for you? Think about that person. Where's the greatest amount of friction in your family? What, when holiday season comes on and when that person's name is brought up or you think about them and your heart rate starts to go up a little bit and you think about all the things that have happened, who is that person? See, when you start to understand your acceptance in Christ, you will now have the ability to whatever God is calling you to, to those others. Forgive them, love them, accept them, talk to them, spend time around them, go to them, whatever that looks like for you. So, so let's do this. Uh, if you're a Christ follower today, you're gonna, uh, my hope for you is to really help you understand your acceptance in Jesus, and it'll start changing the way you relate with your family. 
today, maybe like you're not yet a Christian, that, that this is kind of new for you, or you're just kind of exploring Jesus. I, I pray today that God starts kind of opening your eyes a little bit to your life of like why there's some dysfunction and what the problem is, what's going on inside of your heart, to where you can see that your full acceptance can be because of Jesus and not because just your family or by what you do. So I hope you see that as well. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to peel back a few layers today. Again, this will be a little different than normal, and talk about what this acceptance looks like and where it, where it can go within our families. And I'm going to start at the top of our families. I'm going to start with parents. Parents. So what do we do with our parents? And most of us in here are adults, so we are adult children of adult parents. What do we do with our parents? Well, in the Bible, you see this word over and over and over and over attached to parents or within the same sentence structure as parents. It's the word honor. You see the word honor your parents over and over. If you've got a Bible, go to Exodus chapter 20, and these are the Ten Commandments. Even if you're not like a church person or anything, you, you probably have heard of the Ten Commandments. Well, the first four of the Ten Commandments are all very vertically driven. They're us and God. Like, you know, you'll have no other God. You'll make no other God. You won't take the Lord's name in vain. You'll keep the Sabbath holy. Like, those are very us and God related. The next six are because of these four, this is how I treat other people. This is how I live with other people. And the first of those six, number five, it's about parents. God starts with parents. Look what it says in Exodus 20, verse 12. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. See, this is the only commandment with a promise. It's got a promise attached to it. Now, when we look at it just plainly right there, it makes sense. If you honor your mother and father and they tell you not to play in the road, then your life will be a little bit longer. You get that, right? You stay out of the street. I'll live. So if I honor them and kind of what they say, like that'll help. But there is a deeper, deeper issue going on here. There's something more going on right here. Think of it like this. If you honor mom and dad and teach your kids to do that, and they teach their kids to do that, and then they te- those kids take and teach their kids to honor their mother and father, and then those kids, it's crazy, they teach their kids to honor mother and father. Guess what happens? We, we start to create a society of, of honor. It's a culture of honor. And it starts with the family. Now, I would argue that we are not in, living in a society of honor. Like, well, the, honor is very low nowadays, Correct. Like there's, I mean, you can look at, there's some symptoms that show that honor is not happening, that we're not honoring others, that we're not honoring older people. We're not even honoring age right now. I mean, look at, name whoever celebrity you see nowadays when they get a little bit older. It's like they get a knob installed in the back of their head and they just keep cranking that thing tight to pull their face up a little higher. Why? Because they don't want to be old because we, we fear old age and there's a, there's a symptom of just not wanting honor because they don't think that we will receive honor. I mean, like, we are defying age now. Like, you know, we, I, I mess with my kids all the time. This might be a little sim- symptom of not honoring, but I'll mess with my kids all the time. Like, I'm almost 37, and I'll say things that are not in my wheelhouse of culture. Like, I'll try to be cool with them and say, you know, girl, that's cray-cray or something like that. Just kind of, me- I just like to mess with them. And they're like, right now, just melting. Like, oh, daddy, don't do that. And I like to mess with them. And by the way, if you're 30 years old, stay out of Abercrombie and Fitch. You don't belong there. Just stay out. We're, just, we're defying our age. We don't want to get older. We don't want any. Why? It's a symptom of a lack of honor. Some of you are like, I love shopping there. It's just joking, okay? But look, we are defi- we're, we're defying age. We don't want to honor. The Bible tells us over and over and over to honor. One of the people that we honor mostly is our parents. We respect. See, the Bible doesn't say trust your parents per se, it doesn't say confide in your parents. It doesn't say be your parents' doormat. It says honor your parents. But this is very difficult. You know why? When you become an adult and you're an adult child, there's a few things you've got against you when it comes to honoring your parents. One, they changed your diaper and wiped your nose. That makes it, that makes it very difficult. They have seen you in your worst of your worst. They have caught you in probably most of your lies. They have. Like they, and some of you teenagers, students, they will. They'll catch you. And like if, if, you, get, if you got past, you got into adult life with uh, some of your lies still intact, you ought to go tell them anyway because it, you know, it, can, it can make for a fun conversation. But, but that's the truth. That's true. It's very, it's very difficult. It's very complicated. On top of that, adult child, you now can look into your, your parents' parenting and say, uh-oh, 
that was wrong. That wasn't right. We get into our 20s and 30s and we start having kids and we look back on our parents and how they parented us and we'll say, wait a minute, that wasn't good. That, I, we'll think, how in the world, why did they let me do that? Why did they let me hang out with that person? Why did they let me do all these things? And so it starts to make it very difficult. It's a complicated relationship. Yet the Bible tells us no matter how complicated that is, we are to honor. Honor them. They saw you in your weaknesses. You saw them in their weaknesses, and yet we are still called for a lifetime to honor our parents. He even says this in the New Testament, in, in Ephesians. It's a book of the Bible, Ephesians 6, uh, 1 through 4. I want to read this because there's some clauses in here. It says, Children, obey your parents and Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is a commandment with a promise, just echoing. It's just echoing Exodus. That it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers... Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. We're to honor them. So, okay, Ty, the Bible is telling me to obey my parents. So I always have to obey my parents. Yes, unless they tell you to do something that is totally, clearly defined not to do in the Bible, in the Scriptures. And if, it, if it's against your conscience of what the Bible says, what the Bible clearly says, it would be detrimental to your life and detrimental to your walk with Jesus, then that's the point where you honor them, but I would say you wouldn't obey them. But that's probably going to be far and few between. But no matter what your parents have done, you're called to honor them. Why? Is it because of what Bill Cosby says? You know, remember Bill Cosby would say, I brought you into this world. I'll take you out of this world. Is that why we honor them? No. Is it because they're wise? Well, I don't know. Maybe some of our parents aren't that wise. Maybe they've made a mess of their lives. Maybe they've made a mess of their marriage, their finances. Maybe they're in prison, whatever that looks like. And age doesn't always equal wisdom, right? I've seen very young people that are very wise and very old people that are very foolish, so maybe that's not the reason. Okay, I'll honor them because I'm supposed to be grateful for them. I should be grateful that they raised me for 18 years, that they put up with me, that they made it through, the, they survived the teenage years, so I should be grateful. But what do you do with parents that abandoned you? What do you do with parents that were very unloving and neglectful and all that kind of stuff? So I don't think that's the reason. See, here's what I think. There's a greater foundation for honor. Parents represent the first line of authority in your life. That's why we honor them. They represent the first line of authority. That's the A word that we hate to hear, authority in life. See, we have multiple authorities in our life. The first and foremost authority in our life is God. Whether you follow God or not, God is an authority in our lives. God created everything. God sustains everything. God is the ultimate authority. And what happens with God being our authority, we all do this, when what I want to do and what God clearly says to do or not to do collide, we find out who really is God in our lives. We obey God. He's God. We do our own thing then we become God in our lives. So God is an authority. Another authority in our life is the governing authorities, the government. Like the Bible says very clearly in um, Romans 13 that uh, God established the government to, to be uh, an authority in our lives. And so we are to obey the governing authorities unless they tell us to do something different that's lying down in here, but we're to obey them. The, uh, another area is um, through the church. The church has, if you're a Christ follower, you're a Christian, the church has authority in your life. Some of us are like, well, I don't like that, and I don't believe that, and I don't trust that. The Bible says that very clearly in Hebrews 13, to obey your leaders. Why? Because we have to give an account. I have to stand before God and say how I shepherded, and us elders, how we shepherded Grace Point Church. I mean, it's a big, big deal. You can look at 1 Peter 5, there's some language on that as well. But I believe that, that very clearly that um, parents are a first line of authority in our lives. This is huge. I mean, what's authority? It's when God uses fallible people to discipline and protect us. That they're not perfect, but they're called to discipline and protect us. That's what your parents attempted to do. And they may have failed miserably, but they probably, in most situations, did the, the best they can with what they did to, to protect you and to help you grow into an adult. They, they try, imperfect as it is. I mean, think about this. Our parents were the first ones to show us that we were rebellious people. Do you know that? You remember that as a kid? They were, when they would discipline you, they were reminding you that you are a sinner. Like, you know, I look at my baby, she's one years old, and I already, you know, swatting the little hand, saying, you know, she wants to do the garbage and the dog bowl all the time. And I'm like, no, no, and she doesn't listen well. She's very rebellious as a one-year-old. I know that. And so we're the first ones that's going to show her that she's rebellious. They're the first people that you trusted outside of yourself. You trusted your parents. It's like, I don't trust them now. At one time in your life, you 
trusted them. I just had this conversation with my girls. I don't know why we were talking about this. Just yesterday, I said, has there ever been a time where you uh, felt like you were going to die? Like you were in a situation like I could die at any moment. They told a couple of situations. And I was like, well, what about that one time when we went on that canoeing trip and the the rapids were too big and there was down trees and we were stuck on this big tree amongst this rapid water and all that. Did you ever feel like you were going to die? They're like, no, no, daddy. I was like, why? It's like, we were with you. We trusted you. I was like, dang, that sounds awesome. I was like, but anyway, we got out of it. So yeah, they trusted you uh, more than themselves. They, you, uh, they were the first opportunity for us to not be in charge. That's what our parents were. That's authority. They were the first ones we obeyed when it made no sense to obey. They were, they were our first exercise in faith. Think about that with your parents. That's where it's your first exercise in faith. It's your parents. See, it's foundation with your relationship with God. Let me ask you, how, how did that go for you? How did, the, how did the parenting, how did the authority figure, how, how did that work out for you? How you lived growing up with that affects, can affect how you interact with God. If you had the cold, not emotional, never hugging, telling I love you, Dad, well, sometimes when we start to follow Jesus, we'll think that God is the same way. He's cold and distant and unemotional. We had this smothering mother or maybe smothering father. We'll feel like, well, God's going to be the same way. He's just going to, like, if I follow Jesus, and, and he's just going to suck the life out of me and be smothering. If I had, like, the fly off the handle, always angry dad or mom, then we'll look at God like that. And when we sin, we think, okay, I'm going to get smited or smoted. God's coming after me. God's going to be mad at me, but God's going to get me because that's what, that's what dad did. Or maybe it's on you how you responded to their authority. Maybe for a lot of us, we had our parents, we kind of had our, 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 our personality and the way we acted around our parents was much different than the way we acted around our peers and other people and what that looks like. It was different. And so now we bring that into our relationship with God to where like, okay, I kind of do my God thing, you know, I do my Sunday thing, whatever that looks like. I'm kind of this way, but I'll be uh, somebody totally different because that's kind of the way I did with my parents as well. And I see God as one more big parent in my life. Maybe that we tend to carry that over. This can be a problem. This might be why there is that kind of family tension and mess in our lives because we see our parents that way. See, originally, uh, God originally designed our families to be a training ground on how to love and worship God and how to interact as a church and how to love the world. But that's kind of gotten busted. That's kind of gotten broken. And it's not just our modern culture. It's just it's sin in us. It's sin in the world. And that's kind of messed up there. But we're to honor them. So how do I honor my parents? Okay, I'm supposed to honor my parents. How do I honor them? Well, honor means to give them importance, to give them significance. And I would say over this holiday season, if you're going to be around your parents, maybe you live at home with your parents or you're going to your parents or coming here, that you would begin to start thinking about how can I give mom and dad or whoever that is, your parents, significance and importance. How can I show them that, that they matter? I mean, just some simple ways. I know in my home, my father's home, he has a chair. Maybe your dad has a chair too. Don't sit in dad's chair kind of deal. And so I want to make sure that, you know, that I honor dad's chair. I want to get involved in my dad's life. That's one way I want to honor my father. What is my dad into? That's the question I'm going to really seek through as I'm going back to uh, my parents' this holiday season. I, one of the questions I'm really going to seek to answer is like, what's dad really into? Well, I know what he's into. He's into farming tobacco. I'm from Kentucky. Farming tobacco, hunting, and working. So when I get there, I'm going to say, all right, what are we doing? Like, let's go shoot some stuff, and let's go, like, I don't know, kill something, and let's go work on something. Let's, you know, there's a tractor to fix or something. Why? I, I want to honor him by getting involved in his life. It's simple. Isn't the funny thing about it? When we're kids, we always complain, like, mom and dad are never involved in my life. Mom and dad, they just don't care about me. But what do we do as adult children? We do the same thing to our parents. We're never involved in their lives. We just kind of like, whatever, they do their own thing. We need to get involved. Here's another thing we could do as well. Ask your parents for advice in life. Now, you need to set yourself up to win on this one. They need to understand, that, however, you're going to ask them for their advice, but that does not mean that you're going to do what they say. All right? So you need to kind of put that out as a disclaimer at the beginning in a very loving way, but ask them for their advice. Share joys with them. What's going on in your life? Share that with them. Ask them how they're doing. Ask them what they're struggling. Just engage them in a very meaningful, significant, honoring conversation. For some of us here, we'll say, you know what, Ty, that just sounds great, but that's not my family. You know, my, my parents, they'll just bring out a heavy hammer of condemnation. They'll just crush everything I say. If I tell them something good in my life, well, they'll find some way to crush that, okay? Okay. 
if you're in Christ, you've been fully accepted, and so you can deal with some of this rejection. It's difficult, it's painful, but, you're, but you've been fully accepted by God, the God of the universe, the, God, the king of the universe, the maker of all. You've been fully accepted by him. And so it's going to be difficult. See, I think there's two ways that we can really honor our parents. Two ways that will really make a significant impact in life. One is just to depend on God. Like, when they see that we're depending on God more than ourselves, that begins to change things. They see God working in our lives, that begins to, they'll they'll start to question that. Even if your parents do not follow Jesus, not Christian, it's not on their radar whatsoever, even that, they'll be like, wow, something's different. I treat them like this, and yet they still love me. I act in these ways. I'm always angry towards them. I always do these things, but yet they, they keep coming, and they keep loving me. They keep, now you might need to create some healthy boundaries, protect your soul and your family's soul, but but they, it's just, it, it might just kind of blow their mind. It would do so much for them. Let me, let me kind of illustrate like this. I am a father. I'm a dad. And, like, I want to do the best I can do to raise my kids. I really do. I want to do, it, it kind of boils down to this. I don't want to mess my kids up. I mean, I would say all of us as parents, we ha- kind of have that. I don't want to mess my kids up. However, there are things about life I'm going to mess up with my kids. It's just it's going to happen. I'm a sinful human being living in a sinful world. I'm not perfect, and so I'm going to make mistakes. Got it? Okay, your parents are the same way. And when they see God working in your lives, they're like, okay, maybe I made some mistakes here or there, but God's taking care of this. God's transforming. God's changing. Be dependent on God. And lastly, be independent from them. That sounds so counterintuitive. Be independent from your parents. You know, it kind of means for some of us might be like, it might be time to take some steps to become an adult on your own, to, to move out on your own. But here's the, here's the big trap. The big trap is you came from a really, really good home. And you want to reenact everything that happened within that good home. And so you're getting ready, or you have, or you're in the middle of, launching out doing your own family thing, right? You got married and all that. And so because of that, you're still dependent on your parents, and you make that so uh, noticeable within your family. Here's how we do this. Um, it, ladies, you get married to that man, and, and your dad was awesome, and you expect him to be as awesome as your dad. You expect him to carve the turkey the way your dad did. You expect him to wrap the gifts the way your dad did. You expect him to interact with the family during the holidays the way the dad did. You put that kind of pressure on him, he's like, I'm not your dad. And that can really cause some tension. Men... We can do the same thing with our wives. And we're like, you know what? My mother cooks it this way. Let me just tell you what, real quick, guys. Let me help you. And if you're not married yet, if you're newly married, let me help you. Never put mom and wife in the same kind of sentence when it says, you don't do this like this, okay? Don't do that. That'll save you a lot of heartache. Don't say, don't compare wife and mom. You'll lose that battle 10 times out of 10. But uh, you can be independent. So what you do is you take the great things of your family and you can use some of those within your new family, within the family you're starting. But you have to understand God's wired you differently. God's wired your spouse differently. You're to be a different type of family. You have differences. You cannot redo everything you did growing up with. That might be squashing your spouse a little bit. So be independent. That really, really helps. Now some of you, some of us, maybe we grew up in a bad family. The temptation is to resent your family. Maybe this might help. Maybe you grew up in a really bad situation and you're very resentful and a little bit bitter. Why not, if you can get to them, why not, if you can go to them, ask them the question, tell me about how you grew up. Tell me about life when you were parented. Tell me about what childhood looked like for you. I bet if you sit and listen to that, you'd hear a lot of pain. You'd hear a lot of dysfunction. You'd hear a lot of, like, a lot of, trauma and drama there and then lord willing you could you could have compassion for them I'm like wow now i get it they did the best they can do with the tools they had to raise me and so now you can start giving that that insert the blank is compassion you can start giving them compassion like ask that question you know what grudges are cool when you're a kid they're not cool when you're adult they're not cool when they go towards your family it creates this root of bitterness in our lives. I once heard someone say it like this. Bitterness is like drinking poison it's expecting the other person to die. And so it just like, it does something in our heart. It's just a nasty, nasty thing. Let me ask you, 
The only way, only way to live with our parents, the way we're to, to deal with our parents as adult children to parents is to honor them. What's up with mom and dad? How's mom and dad? How's your relationship with them? What do you need to extend to them maybe this holiday season? What is the fill in the blank of acceptance in Christ allows me to whatever? Is it forgiveness to your parents? Is it mercy? Is it compassion? You just need to listen to them and hear compassion. Is it just being there? Is it just being around them? Is it just trying to open lines of communication? Is it just you need to write them a letter, send them an email, something to get something started? What is it with your parents? What's God, what's God bringing to the surface? What is it with your parents? Okay, I'm not finished with parents. I'm going to come back to them in a minute because it's all about the parent. What, what's another layer? Siblings. Brothers and sisters. How do we deal with brothers and sisters during the holiday season? Well, as I look at the Bible, there's one story that really talks about brothers and sisters very clearly, and, and, and it's an interesting story that I want to go there. Go to Genesis, first book of the Bible, chapter 37. Uh, there's a guy, let me kind of set the stage, there's a guy by the name of Jacob there. He's a patriarch, kind of a big deal of the Old Testament. There's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Later on, Jacob's name is uh, changed to Israel. He's the one that kind of starts the nation of Israel, okay? And so his name is Jacob, and he has a bunch of sons. One of his sons' name is Joseph, okay? So let me read this story to you. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojourning, sojournings in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, that's his son, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. They're like shepherds out there. He was a boy with the sons of Bilad and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now, let me, here's what's going on. So Joseph's out with his brothers, tending the flock. And something happens there with the brothers. And so what does he do? He runs home and tattletales the dad. That's exactly what's going on right here, okay? So he's not helping himself. Now look at verse 3. Now Israel, which is Jacob, that's his name. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his sons. Ouch. It's a favorite. He's got a favorite right there. He, he makes it known. How does he make it known? Because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors. But when the brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now, who is the him in this sentence? Jacob the dad or Joseph the son? You can answer that loud. That's cool. The son. The brothers hated the son because the father loved him the most. Interesting, right? The father loved him the most. This, this, this story about a robe. This robe would be a status symbol. This robe would be just, it would just, it's the I love you the most jacket is what it is. And every time the brothers would see the I love you the most jacket on their brother, they would just despise their brother. They hated their brother. They didn't want to be around their brother. And so some of you got that robe in your family. Some of you were the favorite. Maybe your parents didn't intend on making you the favorite, but you were the favored one. So if you had the robe, Here's what you need to deal with this holiday season. You need to deal with being the favorite. Some of you wore the robe. Some of you had the robe. You were preferred. You were the apple of your parents' eye. Maybe you were the only child, but if you were, you wore the robe. And here's what happens. When you wear the robe, you're used to it, and you like it. You like being the center of attention. You like, you like getting all that affection. You like that everyone's looking at you. you enjoy this. But there becomes a problem when you wear the robe. When you grow up with the robe, you move out of your home, you get into this thing called the real world. And guess what is out there in the real world? Other people who wear the robe, right? And so you may be from small town, Hickville, Chigger Chiggerville, whatever town, that you were the all-star athlete and you were the all-star musician and everyone knew you and you were on the front page all the time. And it was like you were, that, you were the big fish in a very small pond. And then you went off to college. And you ran into something at college, other people that were the all-star whatever from their little hick town wherever. And so now it's something inside, it just drives you nuts. There are other people that have a robe as well that they're preferred. The people look at them and not look at you as much. And then you get into your career field. Maybe you're in the military, maybe whatever. And people from all over the world are coming to this one career that you're in. And you realize that there are people that are now better than you. Kills you. Kills you. You're going to have to deal with that. You're going to have to do something with that. You were the preferred, and maybe it drives you a little too hard. Maybe, maybe it, it causes not competition and being driven is a good thing, but it can turn into a bad thing called compulsion. 
to where it's not about doing your best. It's not about being who God's called you to be. It's not about fulfilling God's purpose. It's about, I got to beat everybody around me. That way I feel good about me. You got to deal with that. But it also causes problems within your family because you're awesome. You are. You're cool. You're way cooler than everyone else. You're, you're amazing. And so f- for some of you, you've been, maybe you've heard this for years and you're maybe going to start unwi- you know, fixing this or figuring this out right now. But like you, you get around your siblings and for some reason they always never like you. And, and they're always kind of disgruntled with you. And they always want to start some kind of debate with you. And always just like want some kind, there's some kind of friction. You, you, you have no idea why. Why? Because you're like, I always do everything right. I'm always doing the right thing. And that's why they don't like you. Because you're always right. You were the better athlete. You were, you, like, it, it, grades came natural to you and all that kind of stuff. And it re- they really struggled with it. Mom and dad went to all your games, but not to the, well, whatever that looks like. It becomes a real big struggle. So, so what do you do this holiday season if you wore the robe? Let me give you a few things. Um, put yourself in a place that's not the center of attention. That's a, that's a life skill you're going to have to learn over and over. Put yourself in a place where you're not always the center of attention. Uh, learn how to understate yourself. Um, see, when you wear the robe, things come easy to you. Relationships come easy to you. you can, your jokes are always funnier. You can always throw the one-liners out there because that's just who, it's just natural, right? It just, it just happens. Uh, your stories are always better. And so when someone tells a story, you're just ready to top their story. Like, here's an example. Uh, wisdom teeth. Everyone's got a, a wisdom teeth story, right? Like, you know, somebody's going to sit there and say, well, you know, my wisdom teeth were growing in sideways and they had to do all these things. And you're like, mine were growing in upside down. It took a laser to get it out. Like, like, and then everybody's just, wow, tell us about that. And you're like, all right, I got it. And then you start unwinding it. Why? You wore the robe. What if you refrained? What if you allowed other people to laugh at other people's stuff? And what if you allowed other people to tell their big stories and you didn't have to top it? What if you served? Where's the place of serving this year that you, could, you really need to find? Where's the place... Taking the second seat. Where's that place this year? Is it in the kitchen? Is it, is it outside? Well, I don't know. What does that look like in your family dynamic? But you need to learn how to, um, how to put others first and how to be, be humbled in there. You wore the robe. But I know that everyone here didn't wear the robe. Some of us are like the brother, the brothers. We were robeless. No robe. If you're robeless, then we have to deal with rejection. You never have the love and the affection and the affirmation that you always wanted. It went to someone else, but it never came to you, and you hated your sibling for it. You feel like you were always competing with your sibling for it. You, like they were always a better athlete. They were always a better musician. They always beat you in checkers or whatever that looks like. Like you had to work so hard to pull C's and D's, and yet they made all A's, and it looked like it was really easy, and it, you despised them for that. And it seemed like mom and dad give all their attention to that person, boy, girl, whatever it looks like, and not to you. When, when they walk into the room, all eyes go off of you, even if they were on you, and go on to them. And it drives you nuts. It makes you feel not important. It makes you feel rejected. And you're going to have to deal with that rejection. You need to deal with it. Let me give you a few things. Number one, you need to read Genesis 37 through 50. You need to see the brothers here did not deal with the rejection. You need to see where that led them in life. It's not good. Like, I mean, just to start off in this story, they take Joseph and they got really mad. They wouldn't even, they wouldn't even utter his name. Like, you read the Bible, they, they hated even saying his name. They'd be like, you know, they would talk to that, you know, that, that dreamer is what they would call him. They wouldn't even say the name Joseph. They hated him so much. And they ended up taking him and uh, throwing him into a well, and they were like, okay, we're going to kill him. And they're like, well, we can't kill him. We shouldn't kill him, so what should we do? All right, well, they ripped the coat off of him, shredded it up, put some blood on it, ran it back to their dad, said, hey, Joseph got ate by a wild animal. And so for the rest of the dad's life, he thought his son was dead. And so then they take Joseph and they sell him off into slavery and make money out of it. That's messed up. That's jacked up. That's what, we're, that's what that feeling, if you don't deal with rejection, it'll, it'll make you do some jacked up stuff. It will. It'll make you do some very ungodly stuff. Let me ask the question. Who caused this problem? Was it their brother Joseph or was it their dad Jacob? It's the dad. Who did the brothers get mad at? Joseph or Jacob? Joseph. Isn't that weird? I think maybe it's because it's, 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 easier to blame, it's easier to be angry at siblings and not go to the source of the problem. It's easier, right? 
I can just take this out on my brother. I can take this out on my sister. I don't need to take this to mom and dad. I don't need to, like, they're, they're good. They're good. They don't, it, no. We need to deal with that. We, we need to figure out how to start a conversation with them and start dealing with our rejection. We need to pray through that. We need to think through that. We need to get some maybe wise counsel. We need to figure that out. Now, here, don't do this. Don't, do, don't at your Christmas dinner table, ding, ding, ding. Hey, I, I got something to say. I didn't wear the robe. I mean, don't do that because they're not here right now. They wouldn't get it. So don't like, but like you need to figure out how to bring that up, how to have these conversations. Have the conversation. See, we'll, if we don't, we'll spend the rest of our life being controlled by it. We will. I didn't get hugged enough, I didn't get loved enough, I didn't get the I love you enough, or I had a boy, I had a girl, I didn't get enough of that, and we'll be controlled by that. And some of us, well, I mean, we all have parent trauma, and parents, you're going to give your kids parent trauma. We all get that. Don't let it control you. See, how do you face it? How do you face your rejection? Until you understand that Jesus was rejected by the Father, you will never get over your rejection fully. Jesus was fully rejected by his Father, God. Let me explain this. Jesus always existed in the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so when he came to earth, he lived a perfect life that none of us could live. And he died this death on the cross. Now, this death on the cross was terrible. I mean, they, they beat him to an inch of his life before he even got to the cross. I mean, he just ripped his skin right off him. Just humiliation. You know, he's, he's basically naked and it's awful. They push a crown of thorns down on his head. They stretch him out. They put nails in his hands, nails in his feet, and, and, and then put him up on, on this cross and, and lift it up high so he can be humiliated. All this pain that would cause him. But when we look at some of the last words of Jesus on the cross, he says, Father, why have you forsaken me? Why does he say that? We see this a little bit clearer in 2 Corinthians where it says that he, Jesus, who knew no sin, he was, had no sin, he became sin on our behalf. What does that mean? That means that your past, present, and future sin, that means the sins of humanity, all lumped on Jesus as if he were sin and the Father turned his back on him. That's the, that was part of that wrath that fell upon Jesus for our sin that Jesus fully acknowledges and understands your feeling and your sense of reaction, rejection because he felt rejection from his Father in that time period as well. It's huge. Jesus understands. Jesus knows. Jesus feels your pain. He sympathizes with all of our weaknesses and all of our pain and all of our joy. He sympathizes with us. He, he gets it. Until you understand this, we're going to have real struggle with rejection. See, you'll expect your parents to be God. You'll look back and say, they should have done this, and they should have done this, and what you're asking them to be is perfect, and they weren't. I guarantee it. Only God is. You need to see God through this. Only God accepts you fully because of Jesus and what Jesus has done. That's why this big idea, acceptance in Christ, allows me to, whatever it is, with others. That's why. See, that's the only way you will get over your bitterness. That's the only way you'll be able to forgive. That's the only way you'll be able to, to give grace. That's the only way. See, when Jesus was on the cross, you need to always remind yourself whose sins did he die for. Not just mine, but my, my parents as well. Your parents as well. Your brothers and sisters as well. They have sin as well that you need to forgive them because they potentially have been forgiven by Jesus. That's what you have to do. Okay, Ty, this all sounds great. But it's just not as clean cut, clear as that. We have this problem and we have all this going on. Okay, I've just been rejected. They, my, my family has put me out. My family will have nothing to do with me. What do I do? When all else fails, what do I do? Let me tell you. In Christ, you are accepted. You have to let that go over and over and over. In Christ, I am accepted. Look at Psalm 2710. This is a huge verse. Psalm 2710 says this. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. When you are rejected, there is one that will take you in. His name is God. He will take you in 10 times out of 10. He will always take you in. You can be forsaken. You can be rejected by all. But God accepts you. God takes you in because of Jesus. When you follow Jesus, when you are in Christ, you are accepted by him. He wants to make you whole. He wants to heal you. He wants to love you. How are you going to deal with the rejection of the world around you? How will you deal with the people around you? How will you deal with the rejection of family? I'm fully accepted in Christ. I'm fully accepted in Jesus. My acceptance is in Christ. This is huge. See, here's the, here's the greatest thing ever. We talked about robes. Some of us wore robes. Some of us didn't wear, wear ro robes. But in Christ, we get the robe. 
Like, we really get the robe in Jesus because of our acceptance. We get the robe. We are the favored. We are the loved ones. How do I know this? You don't have to turn there, but you can write it down. Luke 15, one of the greatest parables of Jesus. He talks about the the prodigal son. Most of us know this just culturally, but here's what happens. The son goes to the father. The father had two sons. One of them goes to the father and says, you know what? You're dead to me. I don't love you anymore. And so I want my inheritance. Give me what I deserve. I'm out of here. And so I'm going to break all ties with you. I want nothing to do with you. I, I think you're dead to me. And so the father lovingly gives him everything. Everything. Gives him his inheritance and lets him go. And so what does he do? Well, the, the story tells the prodigal son went off and, and, and squandered it on a loose living. That, you know, just sinful living. He became the God of his life and whatever pleased him that's what he used that money for and then he came to a point where he was broke and he was a Jewish boy sitting in a pig pen which is a big no-no and he's just looking to eat the pig's food and he the Bible says he comes to his senses he comes it's like this moment of clarity happens he says man what would it be like to be back with my dad gosh I can't do it though he'll never take me back I've gone too far I've said too much I spent all the money, all the inheritance. He'll never take me back. He'll never take me back as a son. Maybe he'll take me back as a slave. And so that's what he does. He says, I'll go back to dad. He starts rehearsing this in his mind as he's taking every step to go back to his dad. He said, I'll, I'll go back to him and I'll say, you know what? I'll just be your slave. I'll just work with all your workers over here. And, and like, we won't even have to talk or anything like that. But I, I just, I, I just want to come back. I don't have to be your son, just a slave. And so he's going over the hill, you know, going over this in his head, and he, he gets over the hill back to his father's farm, and something crazy happens. He's, he's rehearsing this all through his mind. Something crazy happens to where his dad, his father, has been on the porch every day and does this. Father's looking for him. Father loves him. He doesn't care about what he's done. He doesn't care about his past. He's like, I just want my son back. My son's been dead to me. I want him to be alive. And so all of a sudden he sees his son. And what does he do? Which is just so uncharacteristic of Middle Eastern men in that culture. He has like this big tunic robe thing on. He hikes it up like a skirt and starts running after him. And it says, the Bible says basically he falls on him and is showering him with kisses and love. Then something interesting says, he says, my son that was dead is now alive. And he does something. He takes a robe and puts the robe on his son. And it signifies his love and his acceptance to his son he slides a ring on his finger that says you're part of the family again he's like no no I should just be a slave he's like no you're a part of the family because I love you I love you he says kill the fattened calf we're going to have a party why my son who was dead is now alive you wear the robe if you're in Christ you wear the robe you have the righteousness of Christ you have the acceptance of the father now that you've been accepted not by what you've done but the father chasing after you now you can take it now you can deal with rejection now you can love your family well. Now even as they're, if they're being stubborn and even if they're being rejecting you, and even because of all that, you can love them well. Why? You wear the robe that God fully accepts you and loves you because of Jesus. Let me ask you, where, where's that rejection tension at? Where's that pain at in your family? Is it even there? I pray that God would just surface that. I pray if you're in Christ today, you will be reminded that you are fully accepted by him and now you can really love others and forgive others and grace others and talk to others and have those awkward conversations. You can do that now because God's accepted you. You're accepted. Even if everyone rejects you, God accepts me. God loves me. He cares for me. Let's move into a time of response. We have communion tables, two in the front, two in the back. They have two elements on them. Uh, Juice represents the blood of Jesus, this costly blood in order for us to be forgiven. That, That when he became sin for us, that we'd have the righteousness of God, and that was through the blood of Christ, that we see the bread represent his body that was broken for us, that that we would be made whole. And so my prayer is as we take communion today, and here's how we do it at Grace Point Church. We ask if you're a believer, follower of Jesus, you can take communion. In a minute, after after I pray, you'll get up and take the elements. You'll go back, and you can have time with God, time with family, and then, uh, you know, just kind of respond to whatever God's calling us to to do. And then we'll sing a couple songs at the end of the day, just worshiping Jesus. Today, maybe that if you don't follow Jesus, it's not on your radar yet. We just respectfully ask you, just hold up, and um, maybe it's just not your time yet, but if you want to talk to someone today, we'll have people up here at the end of the service, and if you just want prayer today, we'll be, we'll, at the end of the service, we'll be here to, to pray for you, but I'm going to pray, and then we'll continue to worship through communion, and just respond to what God is telling you. Respond to what God is doing in your life, and then we'll worship through singing. Father, we love you. So grateful for you. You give us a robe. We don't deserve the robe. We don't deserve it, yet you give it to us. You came seeking us out. You love us. God, I know our hearts get so stirred when we talk about family because there's problems in 
probably all of our families, mine included. And God, you give us the robe. And God, I pray that through this holiday season, you would help us to just be reminded and accept our acceptance in Jesus so we can go and love others well and share you with others and forgive others. God, I know right now that probably there's several here that just need to forgive their parents and forgive their siblings. They need to get over the grudges and get over the squabbling and the bitterness. And God, only you can create that in them. So God, I pray you give them the ability to do that. Holy Spirit, we ask, convict us of sin. Show us where we, where, where we need to trust you more. Show us what relationships we need to reconcile with. God, we're just so grateful for you. Jesus, thank you for loving us well. Thank you for taking the rejection of the Father so we may be accepted in you. We love you, Jesus. Pray in your name.